Hello friends, thank you for waiting. I've already got two videos on this subject matter already. So if you check my playlist section where I explored the possibility that the two witnesses are two people groups, please see those two videos. They are, let me just show you, this playlist over here. Please check this out before I... Um, forget to mention it now about the two witnesses friends <gasps> I've got some amazing Bible study to share with you today my goodness gracious what if I told you friends that my recent studies may shed a new light on their identities this is speculative as are the other views because the identities of the two witnesses is not disclosed to us in the Bible. Having said that, I believe that all the views, the various views, are all credible. They each have their respective reasons as to why they identify the two witnesses as being either Moses or Elijah, Moses or Enoch, or even Elijah and Enoch, as well as even the possibility that the two witnesses could be two people groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. Having said that, this view that I'm about to share with you today is also credible in my eyes and I want to share it with you because I I really want to invite you to scrutinize it to check it out it might be the least likely of all scenarios out of all of the other perspectives but if it is accurate then quite frankly it's astonishing we're going to begin in the very portion of the scripture that talks about these two personalities the book of revelation in chapter 11 so that's the best place to start are you ready right let's get in then i was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying rise and measure the temple of god the altar and those who worship there so this is already a continuation, isn't it, of something that was said previously. So we are in chapter 11 of the book of Revelation. So I think we ought to go back one chapter. So let's see what's read here. Chapter 10. I still saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Friends, the book of Revelation is all the angels in action like we've never seen before. There are untold accounts of the angels doing certain things without being held back it's really quite remarkable we'll read on from where john is told to do something which is really the beginning of the portion of the two witnesses account so it reads verse 8 then the voice which i heard from heaven spoke to me again and said go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth so I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues and kings fascinating very very interesting friends because this account is very similar to what was written in the book of ezekiel in the book of ezekiel and i know some of this has already been covered many many times by other bible prophecy students teachers preachers but there's no harm in going over certain elements again in this video ezekiel 3 <clears throat> talks about Ezekiel's experience with the visions that he was shown and it's all to do with Israel and the temple and the return of the king which is Jesus Christ over here it reads verse 1 moreover he said to me son of man eat what you find eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll and he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. 
Amazing. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, but to those but to the house of Israel, not to many people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely, had I sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the house of Israel will not listen to you, because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent, hard-hearted. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces, and your forehead strong against their foreheads. Like adamant stone, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. The Lord is given a command to both of his servants, Ezekiel and John, to declare everything that he's been told or they have been told to declare. In the book of Revelation, John is told he is to prophesy. Right, interesting, isn't it? Ezekiel 3, very similar account, but they're different. Let's just notice the differences, but also agree there are very, very stark similarities, yes? Which is what I notice when we talk about the account between the book of Zechariah and the book of Revelation chapter 11. Now, let me go back there one moment to chapter 11, because I didn't continue reading on. <laughs> so, Revelation 11, friends, I have so many scriptures to go through today. Bear with me, please. This is why it took me a while to get it together because it, it would just read the whole Bible otherwise. Okay. Two witnesses. <laughs> okay. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Again, the theme is so similar to the book of Ezekiel, uh, Zechariah. But to leave out the court, which is outside the temple. In fact, both books, Zechariah and Ezekiel, regarding the temple, Israel and Jerusalem. And do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. Hmm. So we know that this hasn't happened yet. Do we agree? This account, this particular account has not happened yet. But we know is coming <clears throat> for 42 months which also coincides with the time of the great tribulation for 42 months because that is the duration when the dragon is thrown out he goes and has authority he rules for that reason for that season it's the same timeline so at the same time this is happening when the dragon is cast out which is the following chapter because we're in 11 right now, chapter 11. They will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months and I will give power to my two witnesses. But we don't know who they are. <clears throat> the Lord has not revealed their identities other than to say, as we read on, they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth which lines up with the 42 months. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. Can you imagine when this happens, friends? My goodness. It's going to be incredibly violent, isn't it? Can you imagine servants of the living God carrying out these acts in broad daylight? Well, it's happened before, isn't it, friends? When the two angels, in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, just before the destruction, two angels were sent to Sodom and Gomorrah to warn the people that the Lord is going to destroy the place, right? <clears throat> Very similar things have happened in times of the great exodus and the events of Elijah, as mentioned in the books of First Kings, the books of Chronicles. We can find very similar, not exactly the same, but similar accounts. 
And if any one wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any one wants to harm them, he must be killed. These two witnesses will kill, kill people, friends. <clears throat> they are servants, angels, who are commanded and given certain duties to carry out on the earth by the God of heaven. Oftentimes, those duties and those tasks require judgment and to kill people. I suppose now you know where I'm going with this. It's a possibility, friends, that the two witnesses are angelic beings. Stay with me as we go through the scriptures because there's more to, to share. He must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So they have uncapped power, uncapped resources, authority because they've been commissioned to do and to kill all those who wish to harm them. And remember, this is the same timeline as the timeline of when the dragon is cast out, which is in the following chapter. We'll go there straight after this. Let's read on. When they finish their testimony, when everything that they've been commissioned to do has been achieved, the beast that arises out of the bottomless pit, I always wondered, is this the same beast? Is this another beast? And for particular reason the fact that the dragon is cast out from above down to the earth and yet this creature comes out from below to the earth tells me that this has to be a different beast a different being possibly a fallen angel that has been kept bound in the bottomless pit from the days of Noah possibly <clears throat> This beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, the two witnesses, overcome them and kill them. Is it possible, friends, that these are angelic beings that have been given a form in which they can be killed physically on the earth, meaning a physical, biological tent? Nothing's impossible with the Lord. Is it credible? I leave that to you to decide. I'm just proposing that it is possible. Remember the account of the fallen angels, friends. <clears throat> the account of the fallen angels. We learn in Genesis chapter 6, I'm jumping the gun now. That fallen angels were taking women to have intercourse with them, right? This is where the Nephilim came from. So there was a capability that the fallen angels, who are against the creator, the Lord God, the Lord of hosts, they were somehow able to pro procreate with the women, the human women on the earth. And their offspring became the Nephilim, the giants of old. <clears throat> Let me finish this thought and read on. And their dead bodies, so their literal dead bodies, will lie in the street of the great city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, which was outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Then those from the people's tribes, tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those that dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So at this point it's going to look like the people of God are failing miserably that their strength and their power is diminishing. And so the wicked are rejoicing. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them 
and they stood on their feet. The breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. And great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. I believe this is also at the same time of that moment of the gathering or the rapture. Again, you'll have to go back to my videos that I've done before. It's in my playlist. Let me just show you in case you've just joined. This is the playlist, the rapture, tribulation, two witnesses. Check this message out afterward if you can. Let's go back to Revelation 11. <clears throat> Come up here, they're told, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, I believe this is the return of the Lord, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And then the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, <clears throat> the one who is, the one who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations are angry and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. The time of the dead is now. <clears throat> hmm. That you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake and great hail. In the following chapter, let me just show you what I meant about the dragon. Okay. So Satan, the dragon, is thrown out from heaven. He's cast out and comes down. Whereas the beast coming out from the bottomless, bottomless pit is coming from the bottom up, right? There have to be two different entities. War breaks out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was the place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Now, if we scroll on, <clears throat> but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Interesting, that is the same timeline. And we know here that the dra dragon is enraged because he knows he has a short time. In chapter 13, I'm just showing you the timeline here. <clears throat> In chapter 13, the beast... And I believe these chapters are giving the whole scenario, recapping and then revisited in the following chapters. The beast is given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Which is the same timeline as when the two witnesses begin their ministry of repentance, the message. Now, let's go back to verse 
to the two witnesses initial verse it's written here and this is i think really important to notice because we've seen the similarities well i'm going to go there now in zechariah and show you the similarities but there's a big difference these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the god of the earth right let us go to if i've got the right scripture there Zechariah. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed this study with me today. Zechariah chapter 4. A vision of the lampstand and olive trees. So it's the same language, isn't it? Right? Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who's wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, <clears throat> I am looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the, on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. So it's basically a menorah that he's seeing. Two olive trees are by it. So the question is, is this identical to Revelation chapter 11? Let's go back. These are the two olive trees <clears throat> and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. It could be nothing. It could be something pretty, diff pretty major because there is a difference. There is a lampstand of solid gold. So there's one, not two lampstands. But there are two olive trees. <clears throat> the two olive trees are by it, by the lampstand. One at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel, talked to me saying, what are these, my lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And he begins to talk about Zerubbabel. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. Hmm. When's the answer going to come to the question? Well, we'll have to read on and find out. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. It's all about the temple. It's in connection to the Ark of the Covenant and to the temple. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. I believe this is a reference to Christ. For who has despised the day of small, small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Then I answered and said to him, you could paraphrase and said, so I asked him again, what are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? So we've got one lampstand. Do I have a visual aid? I think I prepared one. Okay. According to Zechariah, <clears throat> there's a lampstand and there's two olive trees. I tried my best to get you the best graphics available <laughs> to help illustrate the point. But in Revelation, there's two lampstands and there's two olive trees. It's a different scene. Does that make sense? A 
And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Hmm. Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my lord. So he said, These are the two anointed ones, or sons of the anointed, who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Huh. <clears throat> There's a difference between them. So two lampstands, two olive trees standing before the God of the earth. This could be one and the same thing, but it could be completely different. But I think we immediately draw to the familiar, which is found in Zechariah, which is what I myself did when I did those two videos earlier, some time ago. I'm going to show a little recap and I found this which is really simple straightforward who are the two witnesses in the book of revelation from gotquestions.org just a good way to recap basically all the views about who they are so we can recap so we can catch up with where we are in the timeline in Revelation 30, 11, verses 3 to 12, is a description of two individuals who will help accomplish God's work. And it goes on to say, or describes, maybe I could enlarge in the text, zoom in. Because I'd like you to read with me, if possible. The two witnesses in Revelation will have miraculous powers to accompany their message and no one will be able to stop them in their work. At the end of their ministry, when they have said all they need to say, the beast will kill them and the wicked world will rejoice, like what we read. There are three primary theories on the identity of the two witnesses. Moses and Elijah is one, Enoch and Elijah, and three, two unknown believers whom God caused to be his witnesses in the end times. Hmm. Obviously, the fourth view is the people groups or the house of Israel and the house of Judah, or the other view is the, it's the Jews and the Gentiles being the two people groups or the two churches out of the seven churches possible. Again, all of these views, I believe, are credible. However, we have noticed that there's a difference between the vision that was shown to Zechariah and to the one that was shown to John. One lampstand, two olive trees... And in Revelation, there's two lampstands, two olive trees. It could be nothing. It could be something. Let's read on a little bit more. Moses and Elijah are seen as possibilities for the two witnesses due to the specific miracles that John says the witnesses will perform. The witnesses will have the power to turn water into blood, which duplicates a famous miracle of Moses in Exodus 2, 7. And the witnesses will have power to destroy their enemies with fire, which corresponds to an event in Elijah's life with the prophets of Baal, found in 2 Kings chapter 1. Also giving strength to his view is the fact that Moses and Elijah both appeared with Jesus at the transfiguration, which I think is very convincing, because the fact that they both appeared when the Lord was shown in his glorified form at the Mount of Transfiguration, is quite convincing, I would say. Further, Jewish tradition, Jewish tradition are expecting Moses and Elijah to return. In fact, they were expecting them at the time of Jesus. Based on the prophecy of Elijah's coming, found in Malachi chapter 4, and God's promise to raise up a prophet like Moses, which is fulfilled in Jesus already, which some Jews believe necessitates Moses' return. The other view, Enoch and Elijah, who are seen as the possibilities of the two witnesses because of the unique circumstances surrounding their exit from the world. They just happen to be here one moment and the next moment they've gone without dying. Their carnal flesh body had not seen death. So they are also good candidates and very credible, I would say, for them to be the two witnesses. Let's read on some more. As far as we know, these two are the only two individuals whom God has taken directly to heaven without experiencing death. Proponents of this view point to Hebrews 9.27, which says that all men are appointed to die once. 
The fact that neither Enoch or Elijah <clears throat> have yet experienced death seem to qualify them for the job of the two witnesses who will be killed when their job is done. So when I say that these two witnesses, is it possible that they're angelic beings? Well, how does that work if they're going to die? Angels don't die, do they? <clears throat> no, they don't. But if they've been given a human form, then is it reasonable to assume that they would die human death? It's reasonable. It's not unreasonable. I'm so glad, can I just say, that this is not a salvation issue. <laughs> I like the timeline of the rapture, which, in hindsight, I think it is a salvation issue, to be honest. I'll save that for another time. That's another message on its own. It's good to study the word. It's very good, important for us to see the role of angels in the whole Bible. In fact, the Old Testament is full of the account of the angels and what they do. And every time they appeared, they appeared on the earth, that is, in human form. A man dressed in linen. How many times have we read that? So, <clears throat> the two unknowns, the third view, according to gotquestions.org, are seen as possibilities for the two witnesses because the lack of specific specificity. Scripture does not identify the two witnesses by name. Thank goodness, because nobody's right <laughs> in that way. And no well-known person is associated with their coming. God is perfectly capable of taking two ordinary believers and enabling them to perform the same signs and wonders that Moses and Elijah did. There is nothing in Revelation 11 that requires us to assume a famous identity for the two witnesses. Valid point. There is an interesting passage in Zechariah 4 that gives us a prototype of the two witnesses of Revelation. Zechariah has a vision in which he sees a solid gold lampstand, which is what we just spoke about. <clears throat> on top is a bowl of oil and an olive tree stands on each side. The lampstand gives its light without human maintenance, being constantly supplied by the olive oil flowing from the trees into the bowl. God's message to Zechariah was that God's work, which is the rebuilding of the temple in its context, would be accomplished by might. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Zechariah asks about the meaning of the olive trees and the branches, which is another little extra detail supplying the oil. And the angel who speaks to him says, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. In other words, God's power to sustain his work is flowing through two individuals set apart for the task. Who are these two individuals set apart for the task? If they've been standing by the Lord of the whole earth, how long have they been there? Were these two... So these are the kind of questions I ask myself when I'm studying Especially when I examine other perspectives and other views, I don't just take them at face value and neither do I want to encourage you to do the same. I want you to also inspect, investigate and not to take everything at face value even when I'm presenting it to you friends. And I know how much you love my work. I thank you for encouraging me. I, I love it. It's wonderful. It's edifying. But nobody's absolutely right on this. I've got a feeling and none of us have got it right again, which is typical, isn't it? I think the, the closer we get to the time, obviously at the time of the two witnesses, we will know for sure. However, <clears throat> the two individuals could be set apart for this specific event. And to me, I'm more inclined seeing them. You know, it's hard to say because <laughs> I really also inclined to believe these are two people groups again you'll have to check those videos that i've done previously because i go through a lot of scriptures to explain my reasons the two witnesses of revelation like joshua and zerubbabel will have god's power flowing through them to accomplish his work which is the main point isn't it angels coming in human likeness well we know that this has happened many many times in fact, when the people saw the said angels, they perceived them as male, a man dressed in linen, human form. 
if we go to Daniel 8, for example. <clears throat> Hi, Fifi. One moment, friends. <laughs> I'm telling my cat Fifi to shush. Don't think she understands what shush means. Then it happened when, when I, in Daniel chapter 8, we are reading. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, the goat and the ram, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Hmm. And the whole account is revealed to him about the time of the end by a person who had... The appearance of a man. In Daniel chapter 9, let's read from here, from the very top part of this 70 weeks prophecy. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, which, by the way, is a wonderful intercessory prayer that Daniel prayed and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God yes while I was speaking in prayer the man Gabriel who I had seen in the vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly reached me about the time of the evening offering and he informed me and talked with me and said oh Daniel I have now come to give you skill to understand this skill has given to him to understand. Really amazing. What do you say, friends? <clears throat> and then he gives the explanation of the vision, right? The explanation of the vision, the famous Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 in particular the covenant with many for one week is given in daniel chapter 10 we'll also read let's read from here <clears throat> verse 15 when he had spoken such words to me i turned my face toward the ground and became speechless and suddenly one, having the likeness of the sons of men, touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. <clears throat> In Daniel chapter 12 also we read Then I, Daniel, looked and there stood two others one on this river bank and the other on that river bank and one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river How long shall the fulfilment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, that it shall be for a times, times and half a time, which is that timeline, again, three and a half years. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Let's just take another look at this theory that I'm proposing <clears throat> speculative but 
it's still worth worth checking, worth examining. In the book of Genesis, we read, friends, that the fallen angels had taken women and the result of their union, their unholy act, was the result of these grotesque beings that the Bible says were called Nephilim. Does anybody ever wonder or ever ask yourself, how is that possible? Not that I want to know all the details, but to think of it, fallen angels are spiritual fallen beings. How were they able to come into the women on the earth, the humankind, and procreate? There has to be an element where they became like men, likeness, possible. Now it came to pass and the men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God, <clears throat> which is interesting because those two olive trees, when you look at the language, it reads the sons of the anointed one. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Taking wives, I mean, how did they enter into some marriage to make it look like they were just mere men? Something happened to deceive the women to assume these are mere men. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God or the watchers, like Enoch says, in fact, in Enoch, <clears throat> according to the book of Enoch, the watchers, i.e. the sons of God, according to the book of Genesis, produced giants on the earth by their union with human women. These giants were evil, and the flood came, and we all know the account of Noah, right? So something did happen where the angelic, became humankind or human-like in order to do this wickedness. So is it possible that the angelic kind can become humankind in order to fulfil God's purposes on the earth? His purposes for holiness, for righteousness, for repentance? I think it's absolutely possible. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now... Another account in Genesis 18. Let's read this. This wonderful account which is so interesting because. Well let's read. <clears throat> let's read from the top. Then the Lord appeared to him. To who? To Abraham. By the terebinth trees of Mamre. As he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked and behold. Three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favour in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Sonia, this is a stretch. Come on, be serious. I am being serious, friends. <clears throat> it's something to consider. Not that it matters in the sense of our salvation is on the line, no. But to be a good serious student of the Bible, especially the book of Revelation, it's worth us considering all angles, all possibilities. My Lord, if I have now found favour in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Hmm. So the three men... Abraham is speaking to, he's imploring to them to please stay, stay put, refresh yourselves. I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts after that you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. These angels or these three, we know one of them is the Lord, uh, Christophany, actually ate. So there was a form that was made possible for them to consume earthly food. <laughs> it's fascinating. So Abraham hurried into the tent and Sarah 
to Sarah and said, Quickly make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. You see what I'm saying? So we're the two witnesses in the book of Revelation are killed for three and a half days. Their dead bodies will be out in the open. Their bodies will not be allowed to be put into graves. And those that dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, send gifts and what have you. Because these two prophets it says prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life of God entered them and they stood on their feet. <clears throat> and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and the enemy saw them. So this is all going to happen. Seamlessly, as soon as the breath of God enters the body, these two witnesses are going to suddenly stand on their feet and go straight into the sky to meet the Lord. <clears throat> Where was I? Genesis 6, Genesis 18. So the three men that meet Abraham. <clears throat> and the conversation continues. So they're obviously having a conversation. So let's go back and read here. So he's given them meat to eat and they ate, right? Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old. Okay, we know the wonderful miracle that took place. Sarah finds the whole thing rather comical. She's like, no way, that's not going to happen. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, surely shall I bear a child since I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I do not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Abraham intercedes for Sodom. And now check this out. This whole account of Sodom and Gomorrah, the judgment. The destruction is caused when the Lord sends forth two angels. Let's read on. We will read from <clears throat> Then the men arose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation? Who are these other two that are with the Lord here? Are these two the ones who are always standing before the Lord? Are they the two olive trees, the two lampstands? Huh, I say, are they? I'm posing the question. What do you think? For I have known him in order that he may command his children, <clears throat> excuse me, and his household after him, that they may keep their way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the men, you do read that. The men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And the Lord says, No. Right, for their sakes he will spare. Okay, goes down to five. The Lord says, I will not do it for the sake of forty. Thirty, twenty, okay. <clears throat> Next chapter. So the Lord is willing to relent if there are found righteous people there, right? Now the two angels, you see that? So it moved from men to the angels. Now the two angels 
came to Sodom in the evening. I hope you saw that, friends. In Genesis 18, there were three and then two men while Abraham stayed with the Lord. So we know he's identified as the Lord. The two men move on to go to Sodom. And now here, this is the same narrative. We're reading it in its entirety, this context. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. It seems as though the appearance was more obvious here. Whereas before, their appearance was kind of shielded in the human likeness, right? Are you with me? Do you, do, is anything what I'm saying right now making sense? Please say yes. <laughs> when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground and he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house, spend the night and wash your feet, then you may rise early and go on your way. So Lot is eager to serve them, to be hospitable to them. He shows a great respect to these two angels who come to visit Sodom. And they said, No, but we will spend the night... In the open square. Wow. But he insisted strongly. So they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread. And they ate. So the angels have eaten. We saw in the previous chapter that the men. Who we are aware now were these angels. Also ate. So their nature is able to eat earthly food and we saw in Genesis 6 that the watchers or the fallen angels were able to carry out um, earthly carnal acts even though they were fallen angels thus resulting in the Nephilim the giants right are you staying are you following with me now before they lay down the men of the city the men of Sodom these are the humans now the men the vile men, rather. Both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? So from angels, from men to angels, from angels to men. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Which is exactly what happened with the fallen angels. The women knew the angels carnally. You know what this means, right? Procreation. Wickedness. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men. And you can think whatever you like about that. I don't think that was very nice of him to say that. Since this is the reason, they have come under the shadow of my roof. The fact that the wickedness of this region was so bad it took two angels from the Lord to come and visit the place check it all out right? <clears throat> take inventory and even that did not put off these wicked men from doing what they were about to do disgusting isn't it? shocking because of this reason the angels were sent and they said, stand back. Then they said, this one came in to stay here and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, <clears throat> both small and great. 
so that they became weary trying to find the door. You see what happened there? The angels protected Lot, pulled him back in and they struck those wicked men with blindness. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. This is just something about this, friends. I'm inclined to believe that this is the same kind of commission the two witnesses have been given. Sent to preach repentance and to destroy as much of the beast's influence over the world as possible. Because if you notice, it's the beast from the bottomless pit that comes up to destroy the two witnesses. Not the Antichrist beast, it's another form which is a bound being, a bound fallen angel possibly, that comes out. Again, I say possibly. What do you say? So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry. <laughs> My goodness. Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. These two witnesses could be <clears throat> two individuals set apart just for that time that's coming in the future. Why not? Why is that not a possibility? The Lord doesn't need to replicate Moses and Elijah to do this. He didn't need them here. In fact, this was before their time. These two beings, the two olive trees, could be present with the Lord for the longest time. We don't know. The question is, how long have they been before him, standing before him? We'll never know. There's some questions we'll never get answers for, not on this side of eternity. So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay, stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Interesting, because the Lord also warns his people to flee to the mountains, right? <clears throat> then Lot said to them, Please know, my lords, indeed now your servant has found favour in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. For I cannot escape to the mountains, <clears throat> lest some evil overtake me and I die. I forgot to hit the mute button there. Please forgive me. See now, this city is near enough to flee to. Okay, so it goes on. And he said to him, see, I favoured you concerning this thing also, in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Harry escaped there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. And the whole account is recorded. The two angels were there. The Lord raid brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Very similar again, isn't it? The fire coming out of heaven, which is what the two witnesses are going to do is very similar <clears throat> Genesis 19 I got that up twice Ezekiel 9 I also want to show you something here also men clothed in linen how long are we going so far then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice saying let those who have charge over the city draw near check this whole scenario out amazing each with a deadly weapon in his hand the charge over the city is given to angelic beings. And suddenly six men six men came from the direction of the upper gate. <clears throat> Sorry about that. 
I get distracted when Fifi comes in. <laughs> Suddenly, six men came in from the direction of the upper gate which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen. And it was one man. So we know this is obviously an angel, but they're called six men. So there's something about how the form of the angels changes for whatever the reason is, I don't know. But there is a reason for it, isn't there, clearly. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up, gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. In the book of Revelation, the angels seal the foreheads of those who belong to God. You see, the angels, and I always say this, I said it before my video about Michael being the restrainer. The angels are very much active in God's administration, friends. Very active. And in Revelation, we see so much of what they do, right? All the judgments the bold judgments, the trumpets, the seals, my goodness, the angels are everywhere. So it's possible the two witnesses are also angelic beings. Having said that, it's possible they could be Moses and Elijah or Enoch and Elijah. Take your pick, you decide. It's not a salvation issue, but I think this is very interesting. I think this deserves some credibility. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. These angels are commanded to kill. They're not to have any pity, just like the two witnesses, because whoever comes to harm them must be killed. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens, little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. I see this scenario as a pattern for what is going to happen in the future, especially with the mark of God and with the mark of the beast. The question we should ask is whose mark are we going to receive? God forbid we receive the mark of the beast, may it never be so. We receive the mark of God. We are sealed with him, with his blood, the Lord Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit. It would take me a lot longer to go through more scriptures, but I need to go through the main ones with you, which is why I had to narrow it down. <clears throat> Do not come near anyone on whom the mark and begin at my sanctuary so they began with the elders who were before the temple all about the temple which is very interesting that the account of the two witnesses in revelation 11 is also connected to the temple and his sanctuary the outer court you understand you see the patterns <laughs> he said to them defile the temple fill the court to the slain go out and they went out and killed in the city so it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone and I fell on my face and cried out and said, Oh, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great and the land is full of bloodshed and the city full of perversity. For they say the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. And as for me also, my eye will neither spare nor will I have pity, but I will recompense their deeds on their own head. Just then, the man clothed with linen who had the inkhorn at his side reported back and said, I have done as you commanded me. Hallelujah. In Ezekiel 10, we're going to read on some more. Check this account out. <clears throat> And I looked and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim. Now, let me show you something. 
that's a graphic of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember this, friends, the Ark of the Covenant, and when the Lord commanded that these two covering cherubims be made? Who are these two, friends? We don't know, do we? The word doesn't tell us who they are. All we know is that these two are the covering cherubim. And Moses has commanded to follow the instructions to design this according to what he saw revealed to him in heaven. But who are they? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. But I do propose, I'm guessing, that they are the two witnesses. I know, fancy that, eh? Did she really say that? Yes, I did. Going back to that scripture. Right. And I looked and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone, having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Then he spoke to the man clothed with linen, here we go, and said, Go in among the wheels, under the cherub, fill your hands with coals of fire from among the cherubim, scatter them over the city. And he went in as I watched. The man clothed with linen was told to do this. Now the cherubim was standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple. There's something about this that just really breaks my heart. Because you see, the Lord's spirit is grieved. It's not um, something to be taken lightly. He's grieved by his departure, by having to depart, his, to pull away his presence from this temple because of the wickedness that's been taking place there. Anyway, <clears throat> I don't want to go into another subject. <sighs> Just don't cry. So the glory pauses over the threshold of the temple and the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim were heard even in the outer court like the voice of Almighty God when he speaks. Then it happened when he commanded the man clothed in linen saying, yes, again, man clothed in linen, take the fire from among the wheels from among the cherubim that he went in and stood beside the wheels. Who is this man clothed in linen? We know the clothes with which the two witnesses would be dressed with would be dressed in sackcloth and ashes that is a sign a symbol of repentance judgment is coming <clears throat> intercession and the cherub stretched out his hand from among the cherubim to the fire that was among the cherubim and took some of it put it into the hands of the man clothed with linen who took it and went out the cherubim appeared to have the form of a man's hand <clears throat> under their wings <laughs> we know that angels appeared in the New Testament Gabriel has appeared you know interactions angels with mankind has happened in the Bible as a common thing it's nothing out of the ordinary yes but I think what gets us when we read in the account of Revelation is that just the wording, it strikes us as very similar to Zechariah chapter 4, the two olive trees, even though there is a difference. But I just shared with you what those differences were. One of them being there are two lampstands in Revelation 11, but in Zechariah 4, there's one lampstand, but two olive trees. Michael depicted here defeating the dragon casting him down Michael and Gabriel <clears throat> the angels friends there's so much more to what they do let me go back actually what we'll do I read to you from chapter 12 didn't I when the dragon is cast out but check this out 
in Revelation 14. These three angels, look how active they are. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach, which would require this angel to talk, to proclaim, to preach. Something that we've only ever assumed humans to do, or men led by the Lord. Or prophets having the everlasting gospel to preach why isn't there enough servants on the earth at that time to do that the two witnesses for example this angel is preaching the everlasting gospel to those who dwell on the earth to every nation tribe tongue and people saying with a loud voice wow saying with a loud voice fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Preaching to all those of every nation and tribe, similar to the two witnesses who are to prophesy over all the nations, warning them. Another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of a fornication. You see, these angels who are invisible to us, majority of us, they're people who have seen them. After they've died, they're people who have recorded accounts. Even doctors have testified of this. Angels are very much active and witnessing. They witness everything. They are faithful witnesses, friends. They are witnesses and they are recorders of historic facts they record everything factually and present it to the lord then the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice if anyone worships i mean this is the third angel now talking you see how active they are if anyone worships he actually has this whole speech laid out if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand you know there's something about this portion this tells to me how bad it's going to be it's going to be so bad the saints are going to be really worn out weary persecuted murdered through the time of the great tribulation our blood is going to be spilt in the streets friends that the angels of god are going to be present to finish the race with us Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Who is actually proclaiming this to the world at the time that this is all kicking off? Who will be declaring with a loud voice warning of the mark the angels if anyone worships the beast and his image this is the mercy of god and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of god which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. Well, they would know because they would have seen these places. Binding fallen angels, throwing them down with and, sh and shackling them with chains, like it says in the book of Revelation in chapter 20. The angels have seen more than we will ever see, friends. And the smoke of their torment ascended forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, whoever receives a mark on his name. So at this point, when this is happening, there is still opportunity for repentance. This is marvellous. God is not going to leave any option 
or he's not going to leave anything spare in order to save humanity. He's going to do everything he can. He has already done everything he can. But even to this degree, the angels are going to be warning the world not to take the mark. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Such will be the martyrdom of the saints. If we continue... <clears throat> then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the son of man having on his head a golden crown in his hand a sharp sickle and another angel I mean they're just so involved very much involved another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the on the cloud telling Jesus Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Another angel comes out of the temple, so connected to the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. Do I need to go on? I think I should. Revelation 15. What can we read here? Did I write down the particular verse? Then I saw another sign, great marvellous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. So while we've got the two witnesses doing the plagues on the earth, turning the waters to blood, calling fire down from heaven, the angels, you guys, are doing the same thing. So is this all happening in tandem at one time? By the angels, I believe so. It's not a salvation issue. I keep repeating it because I don't want nobody going all crazy over this. Study the word. Be diligent. Do your due diligence. After these things I look, behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. The one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God because by now they're going to let it rip now. Who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Here we go. The loud voice from the temple says to the seven angels, Go, pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went, pours out his bowl on the earth. A foul, loathsome sore comes upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. The two witnesses are said to torment those who take the mark. Second bowl, the sea turns to blood. Then the second How did that go down so quick? Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. It became blood. Isn't that what the two witnesses do? Absolutely. It became blood as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. Let me just remind you, this is very possible with Moses and Elijah. I'm not discrediting that view. <clears throat> I'm basically saying, but have we considered this also a possibility, right? You know what I mean. The third angel pours out his bowl on the rivers a spring of water and they become blood. The angel of the waters say, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, who is to be, because you judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And then another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. A fourth angel pours his bowl on the sun, powers given him to scorch men with fire, Men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent. The fifth angel pours his bow on the throne of the beast. His throne, his kingdom becomes full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of their pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds because they took the mark. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the river and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And these unclean spirits come out. The angels are all over the book of Revelation. 
all over the books of the prophets, very much active. The seventh angel pours out his bowl into the air. A loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. This could be the very last activity just before the Lord returns. In fact, at the time of this earthquake, could be the same earthquake after the two witnesses are killed and the Lord, after three and a half days, says, come up. You know that earthquake there? And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as mighty great earthquake has not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the earth, the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. You can see how I'm rushing now towards this ending. <laughs> and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And the scarlet woman is detailed. The fall of Babylon. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven having a great authority and the earth was illuminated with his glory and he cried mightily with a loud voice saying Babylon the great is fallen is fallen has become a dwelling place of demons. The same speech from the angels. A great multitude in heaven declaring the glory of God, his victory, righteous are his judgments. A loud voice, a voice comes from the throne saying praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him. The marriage supper of the lamb and just like the angels are dressed in linen, so is the bride and to her it was given, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The Lord appears to destroy the false prophet, the beast. Satan is bound. And then the millennium begins. <laughs> that was really, I skipped it really quickly. It's just for your food for thought, friends. Is it possible? It's up to you what you conclude. It's very possible. It's an angel, two angels. It could be Moses and Elijah, Moses and Enoch, or Enoch and Elijah. Regardless, friends, I think it's worth noticing the differences between this account, Revelation 11, two lamps and two trees, and Zechariah, which is one lamp and two trees. There is a difference. It could be that whole scenario is a different account. We shall wait and see though <laughs> when we come to that point. There's a worship song I want us to play and worship the Lord with. Oh, before I forget, um, I'm basically ending the video now. That's just a depiction of an angel. Before I forget, friends, remember to check out this playlist here. and Listen to the views that I have regarding... The two witnesses, part one and part two. Okay, right here. They're right here in this playlist. I like to be a continual learner of Bible prophecy. I'm always revisiting my own position and which is what I'm doing today. Let me remind you, friends, my shop on Etsy. I got two new items I just released yesterday and I haven't announced it yet. I did a video some time ago. And the video was about Zion's sake. And so after some prayer and some serious consideration, because I've been asked, Sonia, you're going to, I don't know, you're going to sell any t-shirts? I went, no, I don't want to sell t-shirts just with my name on it. I mean, what is that about? However, for Zion's sake, it's taken from the scripture, Isaiah 62 verse 1. It's a glorious scripture and I branded it. So I encourage you all, brothers and sisters, to go check it out on my page. It's in the description of my videos now. Check it out. I've got some in female designs as well. That's the same one. Hold on. 
Ask for Girls. Lovely designs. Just very simple for Zion's sake. Isaiah 61. What do you think, you guys? <laughs> every time, friends, every time I read this scripture in Isaiah 62, it's it moves me. It moves me and it's also a good reminder to understand what the Lord is going to do when he returns. For Zion's sake. In fact, shall we go and read it? Let's go and read it now. Yay. Isaiah. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. I want us to read it. Isaiah 62. This is where I got the word from. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And this is my calling in my life. I feel a connection with Zion, friends. This is why I go hard after this message about the Antichrist coming out from the Islamic world. This is a fire burning in my heart. And I want to share it with you all. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness. And her salvation as a lamp that burns. Let this scripture come to mind when you buy this shirt. I don't want it to be just for the sake of, oh, I've got a t-shirt. Let it be a reminder. And also let it be a point of discussion, friends. For those who would talk about it. I've got different colours for the men. Um, designing some more, so you'll have to bear with me. I'm designing some more. There's full sleeves available too for girls. <clears throat> that's it. I think that's enough. Hallelujah. Let's go and listen to this wonderful hymn. All hail the power of Jesus name. In fact, when I do this, I've got to make sure I've got the screen on the right size. No, zoom in. Because last time I did this, it zoomed me out way too much. There you go. That's better. I'll be back again soon, friends. I hope this wasn't confusing. I hope you were able to follow with me. Tell me what you think. I'm really interested to know your thoughts. <laughs> Meanwhile, let's worship the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> we are gathered here to bless the name of Jesus. There we go. Is that loud enough, friends? <laughs> 